welcome to VAR blog. And today I'm with Jason W. Moore, uh, environmental historian, historical geographer at Bingha Binghampton University, uh, where he is a professor of sociology. He is the author, our editor of Capitalism and the Web of Life, Capitalocene, uh, Anthrop oh, excuse me, Anthropocene or Capitalocene. I read the the non English title, mm -hmm. um, and co author Raj Patel of A History of the World and Seven Chief Things. Um, you coordinate the World Ecology Re Research Network, and you are very much in the um, the kind of eco socialist milieu, broadly speaking, right? Is that fair to say? Depends on who you ask. Okay. For for some, like my one-time friend and comrade, John Bellamy Foster, I am, and I quote, an enemy of eco-socialism. Wow. Yeah, be careful that... who you cross. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> well, that's a good question, indeed. How did it happen? I think that we have to ask him about that. <laughs> I think that there is a long tradition of sectarianism on the left. I've written about this, about the tendency to convert ideas into belief structures, into dogmas. And those who call for a rethinking and a reimagination of those dogmas, keeping the baby, throwing out the bathwater, are often uh, labeled as apostates and as enemies of socialism, of the working class, there's a very long history of this kind of behavior, unfortunately. And uh, it's a tragedy in the case of Monthly Review, uh, one of the few surviving institutions of the American left, which at one time had a very ecumenical and broad socialist left critique, especially around the questions of anti-imperialism. Those are, as you know, and many will know, at the center of my work. And so there is a tension between the sectarianism of eco-socialists, not just Bellamy Foster, but uh, a number of others who have essentially chosen to denounce me as outside of Marxism and outside of eco-socialism, notwithstanding my commitment to a class struggle, anti-imperialist analysis of capitalism and the web of life. Well, this is beyond just the scope of eco-socialism, but that tendency, I think, tends to get worse after some kind of perceived um, defeat, either either revolutionary or, in most cases, actually electoral. And we've seen a lot of retrenchment back to sectarianism in the last uh, three years. I think we've seen a ton of it, actually. Um and mentioning monthly review, monthly review is a is an odd beast to me because it starts off as one of the most ecumenical left sources, and uh, it is it is selectively so now. Let's just put it that way. Um, let's not say it's not ecumenical at all. I mean, they'll even publish non-Marxist sometimes, but it uh, it it it's. Uh, and its sectarian concerns are actually somewhat opaque. <laughs> um, um, yeah, it's you know partly defending the le the legacy of Paul Sweezy, partly uh, partly seems to have a very particular reading of anti imperialism these days, um, and it also has a very particular segment of eco socialism of which it is attached. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's funny because I, I was not aware that it get, had gotten that heated, but I had gathered for some for some criticisms that that there was tensions in the eco-socialist world, so to speak. Um, well, tensions it, are good, right? We want tensions. We want comradely debate. Uh, this was something that I dealt with uh, Bellamy Foster a monthly review for many years before my book came out. And I made repeated entities to him that we engage in a generative and comradely dialogue that, that ac acknowledge, frankly, significant differences over the reading of the history of capitalism, the reading of Marx, uh, the reading of the climate crisis and planetary crisis, but also that we acknowledge significant commonalities to build a united uh, socialist front against uh, the forces of reaction, uh, mainstream environmentalism, and which what I call the environmentalism of the rich, uh, 
and so on and so forth. And all of these were uh, rebuffed repeatedly. So this is not simply a quibble, which a lot of academics treat it as such. It is, as you say, a symptom of the left's crisis. And I think you're exactly right that when we look at what's happened over the past few years, especially across the pandemic, we see the utter bankruptcy of left liberal elements that used to, in some way, uh, defend civil liberties, uh, organize against the war, organize against the threat of nuclear war, organize against the national security state. And those left liberal elements have been completely uh, made captive to the centrist liberalism of the two-party duopoly in the United States and elsewhere. There are cognate experiences elsewhere, of course. Yeah, it was, um, it's actually kind of stunning how 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 it's it carries out throughout the capitalist world, including in places that do not have the same political structure as the United States. Um, let's get to this uh, ideological notion of of say the 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 environmentalism, our our collegeism of the rich. Um, Why, you know, why has there been kind of an issue with Marxists to, who either either kind of accept standard liberal environmentalism uh, on face value, even though they might have a class critique of of broader institutions, or utterly reject environmentalism as such, you know, start talking about hyper-productivist smokestack socialism, et cetera, and the need for massive reindustrialization and, and, and things that uh, sound good if you don't think about externalities at all. <laughs> um, so, you know, why do you think that's been the case with so many Marxists? Well, let's start with the first part of your question, and then, Derek, remind me of the second if I don't pick it up. Okay. So the first part, I think, is about what gives with uh, the inverse of what used to be called a watermelon politics of green on the outside, red on the inside. What we have now is red on the outside and green on the inside. And that's not to say that these people are not socialists. They're not Marxists. I'm not reading anyone out of any group. I want to be clear on that. However, it's been my position that this is particularly the standpoint of the political and intellectual field around monthly review for a very long time. Now, I want readers to not take my word for this. Please go to John Bellamy Foster's The Vulnerable Planet, which he published in 1994, and look right around page 30, and you can see him endorse what? Paul Ehrlich and John Holdren's IPAT formula, impact equals population times affluence times technology. So Paul Ehrlich, if that name sounds familiar, was author of The Population Bomb, arguably the definitive and most influential text of mainstream environmentalism from its publication in 1968 um, all the way, well, to the present moment. Uh, and then from there, uh, Bellamy Foster endorses uh, Bill Cadden's, William Cadden's Overshoot, another classic Malthusian text uh, from the end of the 1970s, maybe 1980. And uh, from there, we get a definition of capitalism that is Schumpeter, uh, the famous conservative economist who uh, hated uh, Marxism and uh, derided it as silly and just so much magic. Uh, this is from the greatest, supposedly the greatest Marxist and socialist thinker of our times. Uh, so his framing for both the for the political economy of the environment very much rests on a kind of green materialism, which on the final analysis is what Marxists used to call a vulgar materialism. A vulgar materialism is something like when you say uh, that fossil fuels cause climate change. Well, fossil fuels don't cause climate change. Coal is just a rock in the ground. Oil is liquid buried under the surface. It only becomes a fossil fuel under definite relations of class, capital, and empire. That might seem like a, a fine point, but it's not because vulgar materialism is a family of thinking that includes environmental determinism. And that has long been a bastion of right-wing thinking. Now, why I think this goes to a longer history of environmentalist thinking in the modern world uh, 
And let me just summarize it briefly. We know it best from Maltus, but it has antecedents before Maltus with people like John Locke and Bacon and Descartes. Basically, what Maltus did, he wasn't talking about population as such. It was the end of the 18th century. It was a moment of significantly unfavorable climate. And it was a moment, not coincidentally, of the most unprecedented revolts against capitalism that the capitalist order had yet seen. So uh, Maltus is writing here, his first essay is published in 1798. And basically what he's doing is he is explaining and justifying inequality on the basis of natural law, not enclosure and exploitation. So it's a classic natural law argument where he's using science, good science, to justify uh, a species of policy uh, that we would today call neoliberal, but essentially looking to balance um, the crisis and the problems of capitalism on the backs of the poor. And that recurs. It recurs through eugenics in the late 19th century. It recurs through forms of environmental neo-Malthusianism uh, from 1968 in earnest. So there is a reluctance on the part of Marxists, but not only Marxists, to look at this history of good science and environmentalist thinking as specifically a class project of the imperial bourgeoisies going back, well, I've argued going back all the way to the 16th century, but especially in its mature form from the time of Maltus at the end of the 18th century. And there's a blind spot. There's something that's happened with eco-socialists that they don't look at a historically grounded critique of what Marx and Engels called ruling ideas. That is of ideologies that are so powerful we don't even take we don't even take into consideration that man versus nature are ideological constructs. It is interesting how many of these early bourgeois constructs are accepted at face value. Um, man versus nature. Uh, I mean, I. I don't always love Timothy Morton's work, and I don't know that I would consider him an eco-socialist either, but he, some of the philosophical points he's made about the whole concept of nature as estranged from man gets you into all kinds of intellectual cul-de-sacs, because on one hand, it's it's everything and undifferentiated and dust. You can't really speak about it. On the other hand, it's something fundamentally inhuman, uh, which exempts humans from participation. And the whole, it, it just muddles everything on on the instant the moment you start speaking that way um and yet i even found myself struggling to articulate how i talk about this you know, without some of these words and and i think that's that does that does get to the ideological point um the the, the fad for the last 15 years has been talking about the anthropocene which there is a a kind of general Marxist critique, but you have you have said in um, and, and you know a book now, uh, but in multiple other places as well that that critique itself doesn't go far enough at what's going on in the problems with the Anthropocene. So, what is and then this I realize this is a big question, but what is your um, general feeling about? the Anthropocene as an explanatory uh, periodization uh, of right now? And what are the limits to it that Marxists see and the ones that they don't see? Well, so I think the stock and trade of the eco-socialist critique is that the Anthropocene is flawed because it attributes responsibility to all human beings. And in fact, the uh, num the groups of human beings, the what I would call the imperial bourgeoisie, but also the bourgeoisies and in independent formations, are responsible for the climate crisis. So, okay, that's fine and good. Uh, but again, going back to our, our last back and forth, there's an ideological moment and a historical moment to this that is almost universally denied by Marxists, uh, never mind all the so-called critical intellectuals there, say, oh, Anthropocene, Plantationocene, Capitalocene, it doesn't really matter. The hell it doesn't matter. Well, first of all, let's remark upon the complete unoriginality of the Anthropocene as a geological concept. Everything in the Anthropocene, which is coined by Eugene Sturmer and Paul Crutzen right around the turn of the last century, um, everything in the Anthropocene concept was already present in the Holocene concept from the late 19th century, including the notion of humans as a geological force. 
one of the uh, crucial blind spots of Marxism as it relates to the Anthropocene is uh, a complete historical short-sightedness. So there seems to be very little curiosity in the eco-socialist and Marxist imagination these days about what actually happened over the long durée of class society and, and climate change going back to the mid-Holocene even. And if we did that, we would begin to see that class society from the formation of the first city-states from the so-called urban and agricultural revolutions that these class societies were already geological forces. This is drawn from the work of William Ruddeman, who has a Malthusian explanation, but I would add a crucial Marxist uh, intervention here that class society is not humans in general, because humans in general, that's not an actor, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, uh, institutions, classes, armies, um, churches, markets, those can be historical forces, but man in general is not an actor. And indeed, that was where Marx begins with the critique of historical materialism. We can come back to that in a moment. But anyway, to circle back to this point, that Holocene climate stability was made by the carbonizing impact of the formation and elaboration of class societies six, seven, eight thousand years ago. And this is clearly uh, obvious in the geological record. We can see that the interglacial period of the Holocene does not revert to an ice age in the way that previous interglacial periods did. That seems fairly straightforward, that class societies were a geological force from their origins, in fact, and that capitalism in particular was a profound geological force, a geobiological force from the century after 1492. This is the great contribution of the geographers Simon Lewis and Mark Maslin in London writing about the so-called Orbis spike, which essentially refers to the carbon drawdown, atmospheric carbon drawdown in the century after 1492 that resulted from uh, the uh, genocides of the New World. And make no mistake, it was a genocide. There would have been a certain number of uh, horrific casualties regardless of the invasion, but the slaving induced, the cheap nature, cheap labor, uh, uh, force of the invasion uh, meant that a 25 to 35 percent reduction in population became a 95 percent reduction in population. That in turn impacted the global climate, which in turn reshaped the whole political economy and political ecology of capitalism in the century and a half after 1550. Now, the typical Marxist version and critical intellectual version of this is completely unconcerned with this history. And this is, maybe Derek, you have some ideas about why this is. This is completely bizarre to me. I think that it represents the final or one of the final victories of the neoliberal end of history triumph of, uh, of, of essentially telling critical intellectuals, Marxist thinkers, activists, don't pay any attention to the history. It doesn't matter. But there's a valuable lesson in this long history, and we can tease out some of the details, but all the way back to the Bronze Age crisis, right around 1200 BCE, to the crisis of Western Rome, to the crisis of feudalism, to the crisis of this early capitalist period between 1550 and 1700 I was just talking about. Unfavorable moments of climate change are moments of political possibility for the direct producers and reproducers. This is not a climate doom moment, but a moment of destabilization of the underlying conditions of ruling class power whenever there are massive and significantly unfavorable climate changes. And without this historical knowledge, we succumb to the climate doomism that is now hegemonic on the left, and it's a neoliberal con job. I don't know how else to say it. This is an environmentalist con job of repent the end is near, uh, the doom, you know, we're, we're doomed. And if we're not doomed, we all have to succumb to the climate emergency politics of folks like Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum or the uh, centrist liberal war machine in Washington, D.C. There's it is amazing to me how we went from uh, fighting climate change denialism and and whatever to essentially um both sides agreeing well there's nothing to be done at this point it's all too late 
um, or there's very little to be done, but it's going to be draconian and involve the military. I mean, I, I, I actually have some friends who really do believe that. Um, and that's, that's kind of shocking to me. I mean, one, uh, I do know a lot of the environmental history and I'm like, but we've gone through pretty big, I mean, disastrously a lot of the times, but, but pretty big environmental changes in the past. They have not been as severe as what looks like it's on the horizon, but which I, I don't want to sound like I'm, I, I am d- dismissing it, but we have seen human societies adjust before. Um, the complexity of the current problem is it does complicate things. I mean, how would complexity not complicate things? But so that's all there. And, and so I agree with you on that. I, I guess m- my two really unscientific and vulgar instincts, I mean, I'll admit the vulgar, is that looking at periods before capital um, is not done because a fear of taking the critique of capital and making it look transhistorical, um, which could be accused of being primitivist or are creating iron laws of history that aren't based on just uh, the quote modes of production, et cetera, which could also be read as um, pushing back on the seeming inevitability of socialism. Although that last bit is something that most socialists speak out of both ends of their mouths about these days. So it's, it's hard to, it's hard to know. Um, So that's my gut instinct about what's going on there. I definitely see it. I definitely see this refusal to engage with the long past. And I don't just see it on, on climate. Frankly, I see it on studying class societies before modern capitalism in general, Um, trying to ask questions about say, uh, the, the kind of mixed nature of economies in feudal in, in feudal Europe are um, looking at modern more modern research on on the various Roman crises and its relationship to climate change and all this stuff. It's it I don't see a lot of it coming out of Marxist circles. I actually see, sadly, I see most of it coming out of liberal circles. So it's it, it does seem to be a, a real tendency, um, and. Uh, one of the things that, that, that seems to drive a whole lot of the eco-socialist discourse is avoiding being called a primitivist, um, which is, is a, is a problem because it's always, it's almost always unfair. Um, uh, but But there are really striking tendencies towards peasantism, a kind of Mm -hmm. neo-Narodnism, um, that are, I don't know if they're socialist or not, but associated say with the work of Johan Martinez Allier and uh, Eduardo Godinez and others who have this, um, I mean, frankly, retrograde, uh, romantic view of, uh, peasant society. Well, yeah, they're. There's that. I, 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 how, how much of that is explicitly tied to Maoism? Like, well, it's a. I, is it a reaction against Maoism? I don't know. And what kind of Maoism? Uh, yeah, that's also uh, true. Uh, uh, also, I mean, uh, and we can dig into that. But in this case, you look at those tendencies are explicitly anti-communist, anti-Marxist. Uh, they are a great example of what Michael Parenti used to call ABC leftism, anything mm. but class leftism. Mm-hmm. So, as as a person who is interested in both imperialism and class, and and I think your work is kind of hard to to place in, for example, these current debates on growth and degrowth, where uh, some of the bright greeners um, basically do not talk about imperialism very much at all. Um, and then you have people who have some very, uh, on the degrowth side, who have some very interesting, uh, I think, fair critiques of like what we'd have to do to ecologically balance out the different, the, the different uh, parts of the globe as far as how to handle the climate crisis and not... Um, 
but they kind of get painted as trying to pull potize the world. So, and conversely, there is a sense in which some of the degrowth arguments I also think aren't particularly clear or in some cases not even particularly honest. So it, it does seem like we're stuck in a paradigm where the two dominant debates are really vulgar. Um, how do you think we got there? Well, I think the neoliberal triumph and the smashing of the world left, uh, the destruction of the proletarian and peasant forces uh, following the late 1970s uh, are huge parts of that. One of the things that seems to characterize a lot of degrowth, uh, eco-socialist, Green New Deal thinking is the illusion of parliamentary socialism. And I think this actually speaks to the question of what is to be done once victory is won. But as we know from the history of 20th century national liberation movements, including its socialist elements, uh, the mantra of the imperialist forces was in order to save the village, it became necessary to destroy it. And this history of counter-revolution is so salient, so continuous, so violent, that the brain eraser of the climate crisis and climate doomism seemingly has just uh, uh, evaporated that entire history. I mean, it's not only the counter-revolutionary bloodbath of, say, Jakarta in 1965 or uh, Chile in 1973. It's also the history of a fairly modest left social democratic reformist government uh, in the UK with the, the election of the Wilson government in 1974 that is subjected to a soft coup uh, with the connivance of the IMF, the CIA, uh, MI5 and MI6. This is not a conspiracy theory. This has been widely uh, aired even by the BBC. It's called Britain's version of Watergate. Uh, and it's clear that even under very reformist and fairly mild reformist governments in the 1970s, Michael Manley's Jamaica is another example, uh, uh, um, all around the world, you ha saw counter-revolution. So I think in, in some ways, this discussion of what is to be done after uh, puts the, the uh, cart ahead of the horse. We need to be have a very sober appreciation of the actual balance of class forces and the likelihood that some techno-scientific authoritarian uh, system that resembles capitalism but is not quite that, that really puts politics in command, a form of political accumulation, as Bob Brenner might say, uh, will win the day. I mean, this would be what Samir Amin used to call a decadent transition, where the ruling class personnel remain the same or essentially the same, maintain their accumulations of wealth and power, and then go out and try to deal with the climate crisis on the basis of, well, their program is already laid out in the open. Planetary stewardship, nature positive, planetary management, uh, that whole scheme. Of course, this is the unholy alliance of the World Economic Forum and Davos on the one hand and the Pentagon Wall Street uh, Washington complex on the other hand. And there are real fractures in the world, as we know, from Belt and Road. That doesn't say that Belt and Road promises planetary socialism, far from it. But there are these competing visions for how to navigate the climate crisis that I think a lot of the eco-socialist left is completely unprepared to deal with both the the uh, deepening uh, what I've called World War III, but a new 30 years war that is now in motion, whose flashpoint is the Ukraine. That's one moment of it. But then the also the the mirage, the illusion of parliamentary socialism, uh, which is quite ingrained in European and American leftists. Oh, it's. <laughs> uh... It's so ingrained, I have trouble even asking a question about it because it, it, um, trying to break people out from, from parliamentary and congressional models of socialism uh, or, or even tailing that. So people who think they're critiquing that but still end up tailing it are effectively still engaging in it. Um, 
that's been really hard since i guess actually uh, since in america since occupy since uh, since occupy was was such a fantastic uh blow up in the other direction that there's been this massive overcorrection into uh parliamentarianism and even when you push people on you know like even when you have people who are critiquing like the dsa's relationship to the democrats their answer is still largely like oh we need a third party and and i'm like you're not the structural incentives there you're you're, you're not really getting <laughs> like um so i mean as a propaganda campaign that's correct that that the parliamentary uh, politics, uh, electoral politics has a place. There are people there. There are, you know, hearts and minds and uh, everything else there. But then the challenge is, I think this is very much what you get to, what you're getting at is that there must be a sweet spot between, yeah, the the politics and the syndicalism and the neighborhood organizing. There, there And this is historically where socialist parties on the left have excelled, not not without an uneven track record, but this is something that revolutionary parties can do. Well, yeah, I think it's, it's uh, the one thing you don't want to do though, as a revolutionary par uh, a party is be stuck actually managing a capitalist government, yes. which you can't transition because that's just going to discredit you. And historically, always has like I, I don't have a counter example well so. social democrats always move move right uh and the the possibilities are sometimes glimpsed because there will be left socialist tendencies like in british labor in the mid-1970s where people like tony ben wanted to chart a different course to nationalize industries and hand them over to worker cooperatives uh dynamics like that are suggestive that's not a program in itself but are suggestive of what is to be done. This is why national liberation movements that have been socialist projects break out in uh, the semi-periphery and periphery of, of the world, that they are very much faced with an either or revolutionary situation. There's no room for compromising with the bourgeoisie, which is hell bent on their extermination. That's a, that's a key point. Um, always forgotten right we're supposed to demonize every state socialist project somehow forgetting the murderous uh campaigns of empires again and again and again and again to destroy them it's i think and this is where i um i have a very complicated view on things um because on one hand i think we have to we do have to address the actual existing contradictions of actual existing socialism as the, the, the book says um and there's a tendency to there's kind of a vulgar tendency to be like well you can't critique whatever china's doing because of blah however um uh, and i tend to react against that but the however here is like we do have to put all this in the context of a, of a world capitalist system. And, and sometimes your critiques have to be more of the, they probably didn't have a choice um, or it, the, the choices were all bad and we have to deal with that. I just think we also have to admit that those choices were bad and not, <laughs> and, and just say, well, sometimes they were. they were, sometimes they were eminently reasonable under difficult circumstances. Right. Um, well, you know, my big, my big one that I even defend against uh, a lot of contemporary, uh, actually a lot of contemporary malice is I'm a defender of the cultural revolution. So. Oh yeah, sure. The, the standard of, of living in the countryside increases during the, the cultural revolution period. It was an extraordinary period because Mao, who was out of power, and I know you know this, but just for your listeners who may know this as well, Mao comes back and sees the capitalist rotors taking over, led by whom? Well, Deng Xiaoping. And so it's a, it's a class revolt against the nomenclatura. Uh, in the Chinese Communist Party and an attempt to stave off uh, the capitalist restoration, which, of course, then is set in motion earnestly after 1979. Right. And I think this discussion leads to a whole lot of people who say we need to defend China, of which I agree with them, by the way. I am generally a... Right, but that's a different argument. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, a Chinese defensist, but that... <sighs> 
that there's this this whole like well but you know capitalist ro- rotorism that's really a western critique i'm like no it's not it was internal to china <laughs> itself like yeah, yeah. Like, that's exactly right um so the, i mean these things are important and i guess this the, this should this should tie us in my critique of a lot of the a lot of the growth marxist um uh the green growth Marxists, as opposed to the Promethean ones, and we'll get to the Prometheanism in and a little bit. The green growth Marxists, you're thinking of uh, Matt Huber, who's, I mean, a, kind of a friend of mine, but but nonetheless, I think he's very much in this no, like camp. Um, Lee Phillips, who I'm even more ambivalent, uh, ambivalent maybe too nice of a word. It doesn't about. make it easy to make friends with him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh a lot of these these guys i think huber isn't quite as guilty of this as, as as phillips is but like there is a tendency to not really discuss the world system right at all imperialism uh, is uh, their achilles heel right and in fact when we're talking about eco socialism that there's a massive rift in the world today. And eco-socialists in the North are generally very soft on the question of imperialism. In the South, of course, there is a longstanding anti-imperialist critique. So for the arguments I make around a world ecological Marxism that is an anti-imperialist critique of capitalism and the web of life, there's a very different response in the global South. And that's a, and and also in countries like Ireland that have a long history of imperial of being at the, the uh, facing the gun barrel of empire. So we want to always break that down as well. That imperialism is alive and well. Imperialism is how the bourgeoisie prefers to wage the class struggle. It's not this bullshit settler colonial trope that has been separated from class analysis, uh, but directly how capital wants to wage the class war. Now, of course, the problem with growth, and I don't know that Lee and Matt would disagree, is uh, uh, the problem with growth is that it's an imperial economic category. Of course, as Timothy Mitchell has shown, John Maynard Keynes comes up with national uh, accounting, economic accounting, and GDP growth accounting uh, in the late teens in the India Home Office which was the successor to the East India Company, and then is widely elaborated in the post-war developmentalist project under American hegemony. So this is my beef with uh, growth and degrowth, that, that garbage in, garbage out, fetish in, fetish out. Now, that might be a little harsh. There are many great people. Uh, Jason Hickel is a great imp- anti-imperialist uh, thinker within degrowth, and there are others. Um, but when you start with a fetish, you'll end with a fetish. When you start with nature and society, you end with that. You cannot uh, engage in a revolutionary critique of the system by using the system's intellectual categories. And that's We have to take that to heart. So uh, my, my point about green growth is that it's delightfully unspecific. And I would say two things. First, going back to Mao, we need to be not just red and expert, but green, red and expert. So we need to really develop the kinds of scientific and engineering capacities that would foreground and prioritize technical modes of addressing the climate crisis, both in terms of mitigation and adaptation, uh, that would be appropriate. There's an older discourse of appropriate technology and it has its strengths and weaknesses. But we need to think in terms of that. And then also, let's face facts. that Most of the energy and commodity production, uh, uh, human uh, labor and uh, raw materials and everything else that goes on under advanced capitalism is deeply and incredibly wasteful. And that we could survive without planned obsolescence. We could rebuild the cities. We could rebuild the electrical grids, rebuild housing. We could reimagine a world that, yes, would involve significant reconstruction, uh, but not in some sort of abstract way. Would look at, and I think here, the experience of state socialist projects in rebuilding after devastating world wars could be very salient indeed. Uh, The Soviets have over 20 million homeless people in European Russia in uh, 1945. What what did they do? And what they did was they engaged in the greatest housing construction project in the history of humankind. It seems to me that there are lessons to be drawn from those experiences 
But for many of the folks, and perhaps uh, Huber and Phillips and others have elaborated their uh, a more specific program around this and drawn on these ex historical experiences, I, I don't know. Um, but we need to draw on these experiences of how do you build the infrastructures of housing and healthcare and education and short of social reproduction for the vast majority how do we do that in a relatively egalitarian way? And there are clear lessons to be drawn. And I guess that does that does bring us back to the imperial context in a, in a sense, because one of the things that the eco-socialist project I think has to deal with is that it must it must be a global project. Like, even though I've always thought fighting capitalism must also be a global project, there's some denial. There is some plausible and not completely insane denial on that um i don't think you can deny that when you start talking about climate like the, the interconnected systems do not give do not give a shit about anything because they're systems and thus do not give a shit about national boundaries so um and because of that it 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 does kind of put the internationalization at the forefront and ways that you can kind of get around in other parts of socialist struggle if you try. Um, and like I said, to some degree, plausibly, um, one of the things that I think that I've seen over the last uh, decade, and I would like to maybe get you to talk about this a little bit and um, how it relates to eco-socialism is a kind of methodological nationalism to like everything <laughs> mm -hmm. um and, and you know this is not to say that all nations are going to go away overnight um although you know if i had if i'm a betting man if things continue the way they are right now i'm not putting my my money on a lot of them surviving the century but um but let's say you stabilize things and we don't go down this neoliberal hellhole that we that looks like we might we might be going down um it becomes pretty clear to me that we have to not do or limit ourselves to national analysis. And to me, that's where a lot of this growth, you know, the growth, so the growth eco-socialists get kind of stuck is because their projects and their levers for pulling on those projects, like the green new deal, et cetera, et cetera are explicitly national they don't really have a framework for them to be internationalized. Um, no one's calling for a red green international. Like it, maybe somebody is, but I, I really haven't seen it. Um, and they haven't talked about how, how seriously, like who would be involved, how you'd wait, wait stuff, how you would deal with all the fact that most international institutions are currently um, neoliberal uh, how you, how that would address national you know legal national challenges not just in the in uh, the core but also in the semi periphery um, th these are these are things you'd have to be much more serious about uh, honestly to to for these not to be limited nationally and thus not to be limited in effectiveness you know right both in terms of fighting capitalism but also in terms of mitigating the climate crisis like like it has to necessarily deal with that. What do you think is driving this methodological nationalism? Because it seems to be slightly deeper than just a parliamentary socialist fetish. Um, well, it's actively reproduced by the universities, which I call after Mario Savio, the knowledge factories. Mm -hmm. And the knowledge factories are there to really fulfill two major functions. One of them is to train the cadres, the, the engineers, the experts, the doctors, the lawyers, all of the professional cadres that, that make capitalist society uh, run, and then also to discipline the intellectuals and to prevent intellectuals from getting dangerous ideas. And one of the best ways to keep intellectuals from having dangerous ideas is to short circuit their internationalism and their internationalist imagination, except when it occurs through acceptable 
institutions of international governance like the United Nations and human rights work and development work and all of that. So there, there's a lot of different dynamics institutional, uh, institutionally, ideologically, and in terms of the instrumental knowledges that capitalism needs to produce. I've noticed a version of what you've described in the climate and environmental studies fields where instead of looking for more and more outside the box, heterodox, creative, dynamic thinking, the, uh, uh, the scholarship has, has become more fragmented, uh, more historically shallow, with less of an ideological critique of the largest questions of our days. So we might wonder, where is uh, the Jared Diamond uh, or Yuval Harari of the left? And there are some some compelling figures. Uh, uh, I don't mind, uh, uh, you know, there are people like Jason Hickel and, and others. Um, but these are generally few and far between. The universities don't want them. Uh, they don't want to hire on that basis. So there's a major sort of complicity of the knowledge factory itself, I think, in terms of providing the cadres, both that go into the NGO industrial complex, but also those who are scholars who are teaching and writing and have influence in those ways. One of the, uh, what's happened very much in tune with what you're saying is what I've called the flight from world history. And it's necessarily a flight from internationalism. And I've uh, been banging the drum on this. I don't know who's listening, uh, but let's get together if you are listening and you want to do something about this, that there is a long history of anti-imperialist, um, critique of the worldwide class struggle and the web of life that goes back, of course, to Marx, but also Lenin and Luxembourg and Franz Fanon and Emmanuel Wallerstein and Amalcar Cabral, Walter Rodney. These are internationalists who were, especially that last grouping of Wallerstein, Cabral, Rodney, Samir Amin, who were actually wrestling with precisely the issues that you just flagged of how to deal with the question of nation and national imaginaries and national boundaries in the struggle for world socialism. We don't even talk about world socialism anymore. Like if you utter those words, they sound alien. Right. No, the, the, the <laughs> um, people complain about the patriotic socialist movement uh, and they should. Um, but, uh, my, my, you know, sly critique has been, but you guys laid the groundwork for that with all this parliamentary methodological nationalism for right. the past decade and a half anyway. Like what, while like it's, you're mad at people for saying the quiet parts too loud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest True. about this. Uh, there's been a massive return to bourgeois nationalism. You see this especially amongst critical intellectuals who speak about settler colonialism mm -hmm. and then indigeneity, where in some cases, certainly not all, but in some cases, and there is a significant minority, minority tendency that embraces a kind of blood and soil nationalism, a kind of woke clash of civilizations, and has completely disarmed us uh, from the uh, from a critique that foregrounds the dialectics of uh, race, nation, and class. And, of course, anyone who's ever gone to, I mean, virtually any Native American reservation in North America sees not people outside of capitalism, but fully formed class societies. Yes, they are, they are definitely underdeveloped, peripheral, desperately impoverished, and oppressed class um, structures, but nevertheless... Uh, they they are class structures. So there has exactly, as you say, there's there's uh, been a massive turn on the part of critical intellectuals back to me methodological nationalism. And even where they do gesture towards globalism, it's most often an anti-Marxist globalism, which looks like the celebration of this mid-century thinker, Karl Polanyi, wrote a famous book called The Great Transformation, very interesting book, a, a theory of the alternation between market-centered societies and then what he called self-protecting societies. No theory of exploitation in this. And this is what Marx gives us, a theory of exploitation in the web of life that is also a class-centered theory of revolution. 
and that's completely abstracted from the globalist. So we have an abstract nationalism and localism and then an abstract globalism. What we need is uh, the weaving of those conditions from the standpoint of the planetary proletariat. And the inability, I think, for us to think about the, the planetary proletariat, and that's, the, I think, a good way of phrasing it, um, is you see in the fact that while there's these two tendencies, I think those are basically, you know, critical intellectual bourgeois tendencies, but Marxism as it currently exists right now in the non-China developed world, um, uh, I don't think we can call China semi-periphery anymore. Sorry. Uh, um, <laughs> uh uh not sorry to you i'm just i know my audience is gonna be, there's a couple of people who are like well wallerstein said i'm like yeah wallerstein said that in the 90s yeah, Wallerstein um, said a lot of things so that's all right <laughs> um but uh, uh but i do think we have to like separate out the developed world here um uh and china being developed but kind of its own thing um that because in the in the developed world we have we have this marxism that tails these two tendencies so they're and even though they look you know diametrically opposed yes you have patriotic socialists fighting with social democrats they have similar assumptions like the number of marxists i know who incorporate keynesian or polanian assumptions probably is greater than the number of marxists i know who don't frankly right. Um, and, you know, while I think it's important to have discussions around money, I think it's important to discuss MMT, uh, these kinds of things. I'm not, I, I'm not, I think you have to do it critically. Um, I also think we need to put a lot of this in the context of its origins, not, not just to be like, oh, you know, some genetic fallacy. Oh, just because it's imperial, it's bad. But like. The Keynesian internationalism that came out of that came out of Keynes was one of the capitalist order research. I think pulling from the from the work of Claire Mattai a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, that that you know dealt with the 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 40s crisis that everybody thought, and I think even a lot of capitalists thought was going to end capitalism. I think Schupender thought that, for example, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, that was still an imperial project and we need to acknowledge and deal with that. Like, uh, and if you don't, you, you know, if you're just like, Oh, there's this nice continuity and there's not really that much conflict between the Keynesians and the Marx system, blah, blah, blah. You're not dealing with the imperialism inherent in that project at all. Um, and that, well yeah. And almost all of those answers, too, are nationalist answers uh, and and attempts to get around that tend to be kind of dishonest. Um, and this. This is, I think, ubiquitous in, in the Marxist circle, because Marxism since 1992, I think. I was actually reading uh Alvin Guldner's uh, Two Marxisms, which is old now, but like, and it's interesting to read a book about Marxism that's like a self critique from the from the seventies, where everything seems to be having a crisis, yet also things seem to be on the up and up, as opposed to post nineteen ninety two, where it's like, well, there's China, and Cuba, I and uh, Vietnam, that's what we got. Um, DPRK, if we're if we're being uh, particularly uh, expansive, but um, it it is interesting that it does seem like the response to a kind of seventies crisis of Western Marxism um, has been to unconsciously, and I don't think it's conscious, but unconsciously retreat into prior bourgeois modes of thinking. Um, as opposed yeah, I think to that's totally right. Yeah, as opposed to like you know, okay, let's let's admit there's a problem in the Marxism. Let's go ahead and say that, but let's do let's deal with this on our terms, not theirs. Um, which is my which is what I would hope we do. But well, let me tell you a little bit about how I responded to to this because one of the symptoms of what you've just laid out quite masterfully 
is the divorce between Marxist ecological thought and mm. Marxist political economy. And so when I first began writing on these questions almost 15 years ago, I identified uh, two friends and teachers of mine, John Bellamy Foster and David Harvey, as embodying this divorce of these two domains. Of course, John Bellamy Foster is heir to Baron and Sweezy and the theory of monopoly capital, which is, by the way, a quite revisionist uh, approach in terms of the law of value and falling rate of profit and all that. We can get Absolutely. Into that. Uh, and it's not saying it's wrong to be revisionist is not wrong. Uh, but given that he's really been thumping his chest about how true to Marx he is, uh, it's time that some Marxists actually say that's bullshit. Uh, and uh, so there was the theory of monopoly capital, the tendency of the surplus to rise, that whole model, completely separate from his model of uh, planetary crisis, which is basically a green model, a catastrophist model. Capitalism will continue, as he quotes the, great, the German Greens, until the last tree is cut, so on and so forth. Uh, David Harvey, who's much more on my wavelength uh, then and now, uh, did the same thing, however. He had this, this famous statement of historical materialism in the web of life, in justice, nature, and the geography of difference. Uh, in the mid 90s, where he says all social projects are ecological projects and vice versa, uh, but then never really put that into conversation with his political economy of crisis, the theory of the spatial fix of built environments of over accumulation crisis. And I, uh, I've argued building on the work of James O'Connor, amongst others, that we need a dialectical historical materialism that is also a political economy of capitalism in the web of life to put these moments together. And it's politically, I'll, I'll say just a, a snippet of what I've done, but, but I think it's politically necessary to guard against the creeping neo-Malthusianism that comes into play in a lot of eco-socialist thought. The way that it comes into play is not through population and that vulgar populationism, but through a vulgar resource determinism. So this is the case, for instance, with Andreas Malm's uh, fossil capital. And people don't realize that they're retreating to a, a, a bourgeois approach to resource economics when they invoke fossil capital, but that's exactly what it is. And you can go and consult his book and look at his diagram of the circuit of capital, which by the way, is totally revisionist because there's already a moment for coal in Marx's scheme, which is the circulating moment of constant capital. That's a segue to my approach, which is to really try to identify why is it that you have periodic, cyclical, great crises of accumulation in the history of capitalism, over accumulation crises, and then how were those resolved historically and what's different today? And this basically rests on a historical theory and environmental history of imperialism that by political means, capitalist agents have to go out and restore the, the cheapness of labor, food, energy, and raw materials. Those four are the four cheaps. That allows for the overaccumulation crisis to be resolved because all things being equal, a significant reduction in the price of labor, food, energy, and raw materials entails a uh, higher rate of profit. This is not me for those who want to be true to Marx. This is what Marx says absolutely explicitly in Capital Volume 3. Nevertheless, the eco-socialist response to my work has come, and this is my point in relation to your question, has completely elided this, this element of my argument. Mm -hmm. And so people posture and say, oh, well, more, this is what Matt Huber does uh, uh, without ever showing why it actually matters. Uh, like, oh, more doesn't deal with ground rent. Well, ground rent is about the, di the distribution of surplus value. It's not fundamentally a theory of uh, 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 of addressing how capitalism overcomes its overaccumulation crises. So the short version of this is that we're living through the terminal overaccumulation crisis of capitalism because there are no more sources of unpaid work, of food, energy, uh, labor, and raw materials that might help to resolve the crisis. Without some kind of higher synthesis around political ecology, political economy, the fate of the earth, planetary socialism, we're doomed. We really are doomed because the left, we're doomed to class rule. I don't think we're doomed existentially, but we're doomed to continue class rule. Well, when we look at, say, the, this current, like, neo-progressivism, soft green 
stuff, whatever we, we whatever we might call right the incoherent bullshit that we call Bidenomics or whatever. Um, we we definitely see. Uh, Because there's a lack of cheap goods, it seems like increasingly rents as commodities and, and, and not rents as rents, not that they're separate from capital, not that we're in some kind of neo-feudalism. I, I, I agree with Eugenie Morozov that if you actually look at that, it doesn't really make that much sense. <laughs> um, uh, like you have to have a very vulgar view of, of what's going on right now to really maintain that. But there is a sense in which a lot of what's being traded as commodities are themselves rent sources. And why would that be the case? Well, because a lot of these other things are exhausted. Um, and, and, uh, I think that's, that is highly dependent on class rule, like, like in a, in a very state interventionist way, even, uh, which is the other reason why I think like, where did all the, the libertarians go? Like, you know, like there's a reason why they went away, even on the right. Like, um, so, so I, I think that's what we're looking at. And I, and that's really concerning. It, it's not a good thing. Like, uh, and I, that's, that's kind of hard to articulate, even though I've been one of these people's like, it's already, you don't have to, like, there might be. I agree with you. There might be times and on things of which you have to critique Marx himself, but sure. you, you should admit that you're doing it um, first and foremost. And if there is a theory in Marx that actually handles this and you claim to be a Marxist or even a post Marxist of some sort, you should be accepting of the theory that actually handles it given to you. If it's actually explanatory, like, and if it's not, then you should abandon it. Right. Um, there's been a whole lot of preemptive abandonment <laughs> that, well that, won't, that won't even admit that it's doing it. That's the thing that really get, gets me. It's like, oh, I like I don't mind when people admit when they're revising Marx because they're being they're being honest. It's when people try to convince me that they're not um, that that uh, I get a little bit upset because it's just like, no, like we should stick with the plain reading of the text. Etc. I guess that does bring me to a very hot debate these days. Um, Marxian Prometheanism, uh, which, which is, you know, I, I've read Marx for now 15, 20 years, and I have actually gone back and forth about how much I think it's in him, but uh, it is definitely in later Marxist, undeniably. Um and it seems to be coming back as a as a kind of orientation amongst uh, not a small, you know, minority of Marxists. Um, how do you think we deal with that? You know, well, I think we could start by recognizing that there are two, at least two, Prometheuses. Mm -hmm. There's a bourgeois Prometheus and a proletarian Prometheus. For Marx, uh, the figure of Prometheus from, of course, Goethe's famous uh, novels uh, uh, at the end of the 18th century, was the, the rebel, the trickster, the one who stole, who defied the gods, stole fire and delivered it to humankind to unleash their creativity and the forces of production, if you will, in a dynamic way. I fear that on the left, much of the debate since John Clark's famous critique of Marx in the late 1980s, which even John Clark said was overstated, um, has really attached a bourgeois conception of Prometheus to Marx or to, or also to, I think quite uncritically, to socialist projects, um, especially to the Soviet Union, where there's a kind of a metaphysical bourgeois Prometheanism attached to the Soviets as if they were interested in the domination of nature for the sake of the domination of nature. I think that's entirely false. I think that the history of the Soviet Union around uh, science, natural science and ecology, and even conservationism is considerably more mixed than most want to have it. Uh, 
Salvador mm-hmm. Engel de Moro's uh, uh, fine book, Social Estates in, and the Environment, is instructive and useful on that matter. Uh, that I think that that what's what's happened because of the weakness of the left is precisely as you indicated. There's a polarization between those who insist on an abstract and I think essentially bourgeois Prometheanism uh, against, uh, and then those who react against it uh, to say, well, we need to all live simply so that others may live. And both are bourgeois or petty bourgeois sensibilities, unless we ground them in history. So like, I don't have a beef um, around some specific questions uh, that are, say, associated with accelerationists like Nick Serenicek, who I find to be a, a very bright guy and actually much uh, much more open than uh, his critics would often have him. Some things, yeah, some things need and can be automated. Uh, but many things cannot. Many things around social reproduction can and should not be automated. Uh, care for children, uh, gardening and agriculture. Yes, we can use machines for, for uh, various elements, but uh, but much of life as critics of capitalist automation like ben- Benanov and uh, Jason Smith have recently made, much of life cannot and should not be automated. And capitalism is not likely to automate those either. So I think, again, we need to return to elements of both, say, agroecology, peer-to-peer learning, where there are the productive forces in agriculture can be unleashed in ways that do not entail... Uh, capitalist monocultures, the hypertoxification of fields, all the rest. I think also that in some cases we do need uh, to find a way out of the long-term capitalist stagnation in technology, which has been in place since the 1970s, um, really. So there, a socialist project would need to reimagine what kinds of technological innovation are really necessary to adapt to, to mitigate the climate crisis in the interest of, broadly speaking, peasant and working class power and well-being. I don't know if that goes far enough in, in what you're looking for, but that's a start. Yeah, no, it's definitely a start. I, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, the, the 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 utterly mixed nature of what goes on in the Soviet Union. Um My own journey on that was initially believing a lot of the Soviet Promethean environmental destruction arguments um, and then actually studying what they did and realizing, well, sometimes it was true and sometimes it wasn't. And it was never just for its own sake. Um, It was a lot of a lot of failure and a lot of accidental like, yes, there were accidental environmental catastrophes. no, No, no denying that. But the the idea that it was just pure Promethean you know, absorption, a lot of that comes out of just anti-communist rhetoric was like, oh, well, you know, capitalism will regulate the environment better because of the natural resource allocation through markets. Um, And yeah, I I know very few people who would argue that today, but that that is the backdrop of a lot of those critiques of the Soviet Union. Um, And yes, there were like, yes, of course, there were huge failures and there were industrial messes, but there's also real advances made on uh, on clean energy, on uh, ecology. It wasn't like the Soviets didn't care about it. And and we definitely see that with China today. I mean, even if it's for practical reasons, um, just for, you know, maintaining a, a. a, a, a standard of living that could maintain the current Chinese quote, middle class unquote, um, and not turn their air black. Um, right. th- they have been the forefront of, of, of green technologies. And right now, like, for example, they're the only people making a affordable, uh, electric car. Um, and it, it's not affordable in the U S because of tariffs, but like it's, it's, you know, all over Europe, et cetera. And what is the capitalist world doing about that? Well, you're seeing a lot of places who have traditionally not had tariffs on these kinds of things for keeping their, even keeping their Paris agreement uh, commitments up, start to talk about tariffing that to, for their own domestic industries in the ways, the price of, uh, you know, keep the price of, of electric vehicles up. Um, which, you know, has its own problems. Um, 
but I think that's important. I, I, I like your distinction on the two kinds of Prometheanism because one of my, you know, we talked about this in your, 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 your bad fetish in, bad fetish out, but I have found the whole growth, degrowth conversation be like, I don't even know what you mean. Like, like, yes. Uh, for example, population stabilization probably will happen. I think it's going to happen naturally, frankly, you know, mm -hmm. even in the socialist world. Um, I don't think anyone's going to need to even pass laws about it. It just seems to be the way things kind of tend out with educating women and uh, um, making the survivability of children more viable. So you don't need to you know, have right. as many. <laughs> um, so, so on that, that front, I'm not really worried. Plus, you know, I'm, I am a believer that basically most of this uh what's called overpopulation is actually um, the concentration uh, of population between town and country leading to problems. It's not actually overpopulation, nor do, nor do I think we'd have to destroy a massive amounts of, of, uh, of environment to deal with that. Um, right. uh, I just don't, I don't believe that at all. Um, and nor do I think we have to do the James Howard Kunstler thing and pretend we have to go back to the 17th century to handle that either. Cause that's ridiculous. Um, so the whole debate just seems ludicrous to me, particularly when we're talking about like growth in terms of GDP, because I'm like, well, GD, GDP growth just on a, on a kind of basic level is actually dependent upon high levels of, uh, disposability aka what in classical marxist terms getting rid of dead labor by 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 planned obsolescence um which you know you could imagine a very rich society that i don't know makes shit to last um and, and that would that would actually hurt gdp growth but it wouldn't hurt the proletariat it wouldn't hurt a society that was measuring that in different ways i mean that's, that's right just, you know, that's just a way to keep profitability up. And if you're if you, if you don't need that and you're not concerned about that, then 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 it's not a problem. So so talking about growth in this way at all just becomes like a distraction. Um, and, and I tend to uh, agree with you. What do you make of this coming turn towards? I mean, you've been, you've been implied that there's a strong uh Malthusian undercurrent that's kind of come back in, but not through like the op like everybody realizes a lot of the population problem stuff is ex why well, I shouldn't say everybody. Most people realize that a lot of the population bomb stuff is explicitly racist. Even like liberal progressives who've never touched Marxism in their life will occasionally point that out about that book. Um, but uh, the, you are right that there's been kind of a naturalization of materials that kind of recapitulates this through other means so we don't have to be as direct about it. Well, um, it was recoded in terms of consumption. Mm. Why you, do you, take, you take the same sort of dynamic of the overpopulation models and you simply plug them into through this IPAT model uh, cooked up by Paul Ehrlich and John Holdren of impact equals population times affluence times technology. You just change uh, change the uh, uh, figures for each of those variables. Uh, but it's the same neo Malthusian idea. And it's a way of through consumption of generalizing the natural law responsibility of everyone, albeit in, in, a, in an individual way uh, for the climate crisis. So when people, even when people talk about consumer capitalism, they're still, essentially that's neo-Malthusianism for respectable company. Mm. <laughs> and and the, the, whole, the whole Anthropocene framework is very much still premised on populationism. And indeed the, the crucial metaphor they use uh, I'm talking about specifically the raft of articles uh, by Will Steffen and his colleagues right around the year 2000, 2011. The term they use is the human enterprise, which sort of conjures up images of the Star Trek enterprise and all of that. It is, in fact, a phrase first deployed by Paul and Ann Ehrlich. And so there's a signaling to that that 
that in fact, the whole Anthropocene imaginary is essentially a retrofitted version of Spaceship Earth from the 60s and 70s. And so, so you're right that there's a sense uh, in which to talk nakedly about population is really considered uh, out of bounds. It's smuggled in, in other ways. And yet the, uh, the paradox is precisely as you indicate that there is a long-term population st um, stabilization. And indeed we're seeing serious declines in life expectancy in places like the United States. Uh, yeah. I mean, this has been my big, uh, push lately is like, let's talk about working class life expectancy drop that the, yeah, there's been, uh, there's been a slight equalization between people of color and white people because white people are dying, not because people of color are living longer. Like, and, and this has not really been, uh, the, it does seem like the left has actually avoided this topic for reasons that actually I don't really understand. Um, it, it's, I it, think it has to do with the pandemic and the, the left's capitulation to the biosecurity state. Let's talk about that. Um, <laughs> uh, that will really stir the pot. Yeah. Um, so, so what do you make of the le like, like when you say that, what do you mean? Because, because there is a kind of left vaccine truthism, for example, that I that I'm not on board with, but I do vaguely feel um, that there was a shift during the left that just started repeating the biosecurity state stuff i mean the cdc in specific verbatim and being highly selective about when they pointed out when it was being politicized or not mm -hmm. um and that led to also people like taking the what we might call you know the biosecurity apparatus is statements as the statement of the scientific consensus both in critiquing it so now you know we're critiquing science because we're critiquing what the cdc said which is a vast misunderstanding and i've known leftists to do that and yet also the other thing is like oh we're supporting the science by supporting what the cdc and and, and nhi say and i've been like those are political institutions bros like that's not those are not you can't cleanly as uh, say that, that that they represent the scientific consensus of either the world or even the united states so uh, what, what do you think is going on there? Well, in the post-war era, there were new left theorists like Jürgen Habermas who talked about something that he called the scientization of politics. Mm -hmm. And he was absolutely right. It wasn't just about domestic politics. It was also about the American empire's uh, construction of a global scientific apparatus that involved, amongst other things, the whole Green Revolution, botanical research system, demography as a, as a social science all the rest of it. So there's a huge scientific infrastructure of imperialism uh, coming out of uh, uh, the American reconstruction of the world. And then, of course, within advanced capitalist societies, people like Habermas and, and before him, Marcuse identified the increasing rationalization and scientization of politics, essentially creating anti-politics machines where the contentious, messy processes of a democratic society would be uh, really sort of cleansed of those unruly uh, tendencies and governed according to good science or the best science or scientific rationality in the uppercase S and R. And I think that we saw that uh, really on steroids during the pandemic. And I think that we see this also with the invocations of the climate emergency. It's not to say that there isn't a significant and meaningful climate shift ongoing. There is. It is catastrophic for life, for many life forms on this planet. Um, but uh, it is not uh, a religion, right? It is not dogma or it has become a religion and dogma. And in fact, as you indicated, there are significant differences amongst scientists. We're seeing this in the aftermath of the uh, the pandemic, both with the efficacy of the lockdowns, which now appear increasingly questionable, uh, the source of the the virus itself, and uh, the safety of uh, the uh, uh, vaccines, which are uh, not really vaccines in the way that polio is a vaccine, right? Uh, 
uh, and the, the uh, incidence of vaccine injury uh, is uh, quite extraordinary. Early on in the process, the Nordic countries said uh, for men under the age of 30, no, no vaccines if they're otherwise healthy, right? And it's, it is, I'm not anti-vax, I've been vaxxed. Uh, you know, people who are at risk um, with comorbidities should get, get vaccinated. Uh, none of this discounts those insights, but the point is that it was totally ideologized in the way that you indicated where um, scientific research to the contrary of uh, the CDC was actively suppressed. People were censored. There's become a widespread popular embrace of censorship. Uh, on social media, on YouTube and elsewhere. And so there are, um, you know, real issues that need to be addressed that were just totally suppressed ideologically. I agree with actually all those statements. In fact, I would go on to say that, like, one of the things that was super frustrating about, about all this was... Uh, uh, the left response was so trusting uh, of the state um, and big pharma. Uh, yeah, and and that while the efficacy of the vaccines uh, is is not terrible from what I tell from from reading it, it, it was oversold. And like when you look at the risk factor, for for people under 20 um mm -hmm. getting covid versus people um that versus people above that uh it's it's about neil in some cases maybe the 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 comorbidities of the vaccine are higher with younger people um particularly of like heart swelling and stuff like that um and yet what I'll be told when I talk about that is like, oh, well, there's all these unreported youth, youth COVID deaths. And I'm like, can you prove it? Um, yeah, uh, we're still what, waiting for those to, well, to be reported. Yeah. Well, what what do you what, I mean? Yes, there's a lot of excess deaths right now. Um, th th there are. But I, I a lot of those are not being claimed to be COVID by anybody. So. Um, right. I mean, the demography is uh, still very much up in the air. And there were many people who uh, were admitted to hospitals uh, and, uh, with other conditions had COVID. Uh, those are people who died with COVID. Uh, now, I'm not trying to underestimate the significant and horrific toll that many, many people uh, experienced, including me and my family, where it was a terrifying moment. I think the uh, the point, however, that you and I are raising is that we need a critical sensibility about the claims of big pharma and the FDA and the CDC and the extent of uh, um, agency capture, which is extraordinary, as the left has made clear for many years. Um, respect of civil liberties, all of these were uh, all of these critical sensibilities were thrown out the window. Now, the connection to our conversation as a whole of course, is that the same emergency politics invoked during the pandemic uh, are and will be on a greater scale invoked around the climate emergency. And so we need to raise very, very serious questions about this, that in a lot of ways, uh, the ruling classes of the world are preparing for uh, how to maintain their rule in the planetary inferno and whose rule can survive and whether or not the Wall Street White House uh, uh, Davos condominium can Pentagon uh, Alliance can win the day. I think it's quite doubtful. They've lost the Global South. There's a looming conflict with Belt and Road and the Global South. But these politics of what I call good science uh, mm -hmm. are going to be fundamental to how to realize actual climate justice. We cannot any longer be captive to this climate emergency rhetoric, which is always a state of emergency rhetoric, always favors the ruling classes. And we saw that during the pandemic, which, by the way, was the moment of the greatest and most rapid upward transfer of wealth in American history. Uh, and so many of the people on the left forget that as well. No, that's that is a. Uh... 
something that's been in the back of my mind this whole time was how much, how many resources were grabbed, um, how much capital was, I mean, a lot of the capital was just created, but, um, but if you look at who's going to be paying through austerity in the next decade um, and how even the small mitigations of that austerity, like the anemic, uh, um, student debt forgiveness program, which, which I've always think was somewhat set up to fail because like actual structural, uh, fixes to the, to the student loan fiction, even from a capitalist point of view, were not discussed like, okay, let's just cap the interest at 1% or something like that. Like, right. Right. like that wasn't, no one's ever put that even on the table, which tells me it was never really serious. Um, and and, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of like, we've seen a lot of Democrats doing weird, weird double speak on both crime and emergency, but also claiming like fairly anemic responses like the, the green development stuff in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act are like massive programs, even though they don't even meet. And, and I guess they are historically big compared to what have been done priorly, but they don't even meet the Paris Accord commitments. So it's like, wh who are you fooling here? Um, uh, but similarly with the, with the discourse around, uh, COVID, um, where fear of crankery and yes, there was a lot of crankery. I'm not like, I'm not going to deny that there's a lot of anti vast conspiracy theorists. There's a lot of, there's a lot of nuttiness, but fear of that was used to shut down discussions of anything, including maybe, for example, undercounting. COVID deaths that, during during the Biden administration's first year. Um, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that was potentially censored and people didn't really deal with. Or like the CDC just deciding like, well, you know, that stuff we said about 14 days, let's move it five. Like, okay. Um, that was clearly politicized, but also... I haven't seen it much discussed. Um, so you're right. There was a biosecurity state acceptance during this time period. And talking about it has been seen as being making concessions to the right, which I don't believe it is. I, I, I'm like, no, you know, uh, there's there's a whole lot of there's been a whole lot of shenanigans here. And what I what worries me about it, I guess, to some degree why I'm talking about it so carefully right here is that there is a tendency that when you censor stuff like that and you're like, well, the left narrative is the state's narrative that people who are, are critical, uh, you know, uh, of the CDC and NHI's discussion of this, then do go to the right because they're the only people talking about this. Right. Um, and that, that's something that we should be, really concerned about i mean like you know mitigation discussions beyond masking or whatever and, and, and like i'm not i'm not which a man was, masker either but. which was totally ineffective i mean if we're talking paper masks right mm -hmm. paper masks totally ineffective no yeah but you, you, you needed you needed mass manufacturer of kn95s um and not like what was the biden when they finally did it we're gonna give you one like it's just like okay um uh so and there are complications to that too so like like i'm not I, again i'm not anti-mask i'm not an anti-masker however other mass mitigation stuff like really fixing our ventilation systems stuff like that they were never on the table right um and instead we talked about, oh, you know, building ventilators and, and stuff that like largely don't work. Um, so, so that's, uh, that's crucial. And, you know, the administration, the, the Biden administration actually did. And I think, you know, uh, maybe I'll get pushback on this, but they did overstate the transmission effect efficacy of the vaccine. dramatically. Well, the line changed from month right. to month as well. Right. And so and people say, oh, the science changed. I'm like, they were making declarations before they knew what the science said. Right. Like 
that's not the science changing. That is like pretending you have confidence you don't have. And, and uh, yeah, you're right. One thing I, I have thought about, about, you know, the climate emergency stuff um, is I, I have pointed out that, that emergencies are necessarily conservatizing. This is like my, this is what I push back on like uh, collapse accelerationist. You're like, Oh, if we push everything to collapse, then we'll get socialism in the, in the, in the outcome. And I, I've always been like, that's a disastrous uh, way of thinking because one historically, actually when we get the most reactionary regimes is when you try to do that shit. And two, um, I think it fundamentally doesn't understand human reaction because like, in those scenarios, um, particularly when they're not done on class lines, um, it is very easy to convince people that their immediate interests need to be suppressed for long-term interest. And lo and behold, those long-term interests tend to be status quo interest. So shut the fuck up. Right. Like that tends to be how that gets played out. Right. And, um, if anything, I, I want to ask your opinion on this. What do you make of all the 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 quote Marxist concessions to the Biden administration? Because there's a whole lot of Marxists who have been very quiet on criticizing the Biden administration in ways that they were not on criticizing, say, the Obama administration. Um, what hmm. what do you think is driving that? Is it part of this whole general capitulation? Or I don't know. I mean, who who are you thinking of? If you don't mind naming a name, well, uh, Dylan Riley and and uh, and Robert Brenner, for example, uh, they, they do critique Biden, but it's pretty mild. Um, uh, I mean, I think that there are a lot of uh, professors, even left wing professors, who saw Trump as the coming of fascism. And my reading is very different. The Trump is indeed a, a, a classic American case of a right wing nationalist, which also explains his right wing anti-imperialism, incidentally. And that centrist liberalism uh, in the present conjuncture brings forth, I don't want to say fascism, but a lot more of a techno dystopian surveillance state capitalism than would was possible before that the uh, and this is revealed not just in the biosecurity state but i think in a proliferation of other measures that we're seeing not just in the u.s but all around the world i mean we see people like uh, nigel Far farage uh mm -hmm. in the uk being debanked and yes he's terrible um has terrible politics uh a, a cognate version of that justin trudeau invoking anti-terror legislation to debank the truckers um uh, in their protests that, uh, yes, these are right wing elements, but everybody knows that the left will be uh, 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 high on the docket for the next round. So I think that there was a hangover from Trump that a lot of leftists in the academy saw Trump as significantly qualitatively worse than somebody like Hillary Clinton. I think that's fair to say. And they were sort of freaked out about it. Uh, I just don't share that assessment. In fact, I thought if you lived anywhere in the world outside the United States, especially in the global South, you were probably much happier with Trump than with Clinton, who was the architect of various war crimes, uh, foremost among them, uh, the destruction of Libya. So uh, I think, again, this speaks back to the centrality of imperialism and anti-imperialist critique and in, in some people's response. This is actually uh, this actually brings up an interesting problem. Um, it doesn't get framed in, in the terms of eco-socialism that much, but it's something I think we should talk about, which is there is an actual right-wing anti-imperialism. Like, yeah. It's a real thing. That's right. Um, it's often incoherent. And with someone like Trump, you can have both like that right-wing anti-imperialism and broad gestures towards neoconservative policies in the same person at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so when, you know, when you talk about someone like Trump, it's, it's, it's hard to parse. But one of the things that I, I pointed out to people in 2016, cause I was in Egypt at the time. And I was like, look, my elite educated students who all speak English and watch Western media are all highly anti-Trump, even though they're from Egypt and Yemen and et cetera. But the average person on the street in Egypt, um, uh, 
until he declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel, mm -hmm. uh, which happened after I left. But uh, they they were pretty supportive of Trump, believe it or not, and they were they were supportive of Trump along the lines of look, we, we trusted Obama and then he ended up being the, the same kind of shill. And also we couldn't figure out even how he was dealing with our politics. Like he was interfering with our politics, but seemed to be playing both sides. And the average Egyptian knew that. Right. Um, and, and, you know, that led to uh, very anti-American sentiment. And when I say anti-American sentiment, I also am very specific because one of the things I've experienced is like European anti-Americanism tends to be at every American. Um, when I've been in the developing world, uh, anti-Americanism isn't aimed at me. It's aimed at my government. Yeah. Um, for the most part, I've always found that interesting because it's just like when I'm in Europe, it's like, oh, no, that, you know, they think I'm an uncouth barbarian. And then when I am in uh, like Mexico or Egypt, uh, places where I've lived, um, it's like, no, your government is is the uncouth barbarian. And we know you don't really control that. <laughs> um, and I think that's an interesting difference. Uh, I don't know. what I have no real theory as to why that is. But um, but it was interesting trying to explain that to people in in liberal circles and left circles back home in 2016, where I was like, the vast majority of people out here either don't care or they are mildly supportive of Trump, not because they trust him or think he's going to be good, but because they think like, well, he's going to be honest and he's probably slightly less likely to blow people up. And we know, we, we know where he actually stands. Right. Um, and at the time in 2016, my, my, my initial response to the Trump election was, uh, a lot of people are going to be crazy, but I don't know that it matters that much. And I think that shocked a lot of people. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like, I didn't predict his win. I'm not, I'm not going to claim that. Um, although I did think it was a possibility. Uh, and, but, but one of the things I've been pointing out to people in the last, you know, and I'm not one of these people who think the left should like, oh, we should go like MAGA communism or something patently ridiculous like that. Like that's not that's not at all what I'm advocating for. But I do think we have to ask ourselves some serious questions when we're like when we are in a cul-de-sac where we'll do anything to support the Democratic Party. Uh even for even if you thought um parliamentary socialism was possible. Uh, putting yourself in a position where your primary job is to defend one of the two bourgeois parties seems absurd as far as like even from the parliamentary viewpoints like like well if they know that you're going to back them up no matter what they do and you'll never even sit out then what do you have as leverage nothing right, right? nothing at all and that's also going to be true on climate policy and stuff too guys like like it's not just going to be like you're going to get you know the word I, although i do remember being very frustrated in say uh 2021 when like the democrats the one thing they wouldn't budge on was like increased carbon taxes and i'm like why are you always aimed at making the reforms hit the poor and be unpopular well, because they hate the poor and working class and they don't give a shit. I mean, the and the data is, is uh, you know, out there for, for decades. I think maybe one of the crucial nodes of, of discussion here is the relationship between imperialism and the climate crisis. The climate policy and foreign policy are dialectically joined. Unfortunately, nobody in the environmentalist movement shares that opinion. And they come by it honestly because the environmentalist movement was born in the Vietnam War as a kind of wedge issue to divide the anti-war left from uh, uh, liberal professionals and young, young liberal professionals especially. People forget this, but a week after the first Earth Day on April 22nd, 1970, one week uh, to the day after that, Nixon orders uh, the South Vietnamese Army and the U.S. Army and Air Force into the horrific bombing campaigns in Cambodia and Laos. That sets in motion most famously the Kent State and Jackson State killings right afterwards. And the environmentalists uh, did nothing. 
And the environmentalists in the United States have always been handmaidens to empire. I cannot recall except maybe a Greenpeace organization. Greenpeace has its its uh, one or maybe both feet planted in the anti-nuke movement, which is very a very different political ecosystem from, say, the Sierra Club. Uh, the big greens never mobilized against any major war that the United States was undertaking. And this is a point I make about the Anthropocene discourse all the time, that since 1999, the United States has conducted fully one third of its over 500 foreign military interventions. So of all those that have occurred since 1776, this is from the Military Interventions Project at Tufts University, one third of all its interventions have occurred since 1991. The overlap with this liberal climate crisis hand wringing is unavoidable. And so we need to add, begin to ask some very hard questions about these um, climate science researchers, climate social scientists who have said nothing about America's forever wars and imperialism. And it's not to blame them. I believe they are absolutely sincere. And we need to bring pressure to bear on these, uh, these people who form expert opinion. Uh, about the relationship between America's forever wars, its bloated military industrial complex, and the climate crisis. I think that's a, that's a, that's a great point, particularly when you consider how much pollution that the, the U.S. military does just by well, itself. That. And liberals are willing to do that. So Netta Crawford, who uh, teaches at, uh, uh, wrote a paper for Brown University, I forget where she teaches, uh, wrote this piece, which ends, uh, and, and yet what, what these pieces never end up saying, they never end up connecting the dots, that the 800-plus military bases, the special forces operations in three-quarters of the world's countries are operating to maintain and reproduce the climate business as usual. So it's not just what they're emitting, but it's the whole, they're the protection racket for the whole climate crisis apparatus. Mm. I mean, people forget. I mean, really, this is, the, you know, the paraphrase of Mao, that economic power grows from the barrel of a gun. And again, many of these social Democrats and left eco-socialists are not willing to touch these questions of the ongoing use of force as a permanent weapon. Rosa Luxemburg liked to say that in the history of capitalism. That's absolutely what's there. And I think that as the climate crisis deepens, we are likely to see an intensification of the permanent war strategy on the part of a Euro-American condominium, maybe with the Japanese in play as well. Um, and of course, all the saber rattling and encirclement that goes in the direction of China. Mm -hmm, which we've definitely seen a bipartisan increase of. I mean, there is very recently a kind of it seems like the Biden administration is kind of like, well, we have to dial it back a tad because we don't actually want a full on war, but just a tad. Um, and, and yeah, that's what that's the kind of stuff where I think we have to really be careful right now, um, because I'm waiting for that to be framed in a it has not yet, but I'm waiting for that to be framed in a green environment. And, and you're right to point this out, Jason, that there's this huge underplaying of the role of the military in U.S. society because since the 1970s, or even actually since more recently, uh, I was talking to someone about the poverty draft. I'm like, well, that's because liberals just aren't keeping up. That, you know, there's current leftists, like, there's never been a poverty draft. Yes, there was. Uh, it's just, it all was before 2006. And it was also more sneaky than you think. It wasn't just people it tied into policy it was like most of the red the kind of mid-size red state economy was actually totally tied into the military apparatus mm -hmm. and, and that went away with it with it being neoliberalized actually during the, the the iraq the second iraq war which i think has been under understood because it was very stealth um and the move to drones and all that was very much part of that. Um, and that was maintained under Obama. So there was no real democratic uh, eye on this either. Um, and I think that 
we have to look at that role because because of that, it means we don't see how much of a role the military plays in U.S. society because that, you know, it not everyone is obviously directly involved in it. But as I've been pointing out, like there's hardly a piece of primary science research in this country that doesn't touch DARPA like and stuff like that. Like it, it's like it's almost like the snake in like it really is like what you can't talk about because if you talked about it like like you'd have to really deal with um all these other problems that that are why for example you're never going to get the quote squad to like vote against military funding because it would even collapse their social remediation projects and whatever but and and, and in that way there is a real way in which it is tied to imperialism that, that a lot of people do not want to look at i don't think it, i don't think a u.s socialist project has to be imperialist that's not what i'm saying or that we should totally abandon the first world proletariat or whatever i think that's ridiculous but that we do have to look at that like we do have to look at how many of these um programs are based on programs that require say u.s dollar hegemony if nothing else and and u.s dollar hegemony is directly tied into to the military they, like when people you know when mmt is like oh there's ideological reasons why people you know people are pegging their stuff to dollar i'm like is it or do they have to buy u.s stuff and if they don't buy u.s stuff uf gunboats might be in their harbors i don't really know like <laughs> how this is not obvious to you um uh, so it's it, it's an interesting conundrum and i think right now it's a particularly complicated conundrum because it um you brought up the the, the russia ukraine war and that has um my views on that are complicated but i think it that really has been a way for the the u.s military industrial complex to like keep its funding going and keep itself active without the downside of actually being directly in a war, which is, which has become vastly unpopular, even on the right these days. Um, so, and you know, if you don't think that's going to have an environmental toll, I don't know what you're on, um, but uh, I think you're absolutely right about that, but it's very, it's very hidden from the average person uh, now in a way that, you know, and, and I think in a lot of the beginning of the 20th century and, and, and maybe even up until like the 1980s, it wasn't hidden. Um, and so it makes it very easy for social Democrats to just ignore it. Um, okay. Uh, right. And I, I do think you're also right that this emergency mentality um, is going to be used. I think about the climate Leviathan book and, and my, I actually sort of think we're not going to get climate Leviathan. I think we're probably going to get climate, the, the climate behemoth section, which is just like, like we'll get some green concessions, but it's going to be in terms of international competition and uh, it's going to be bad, but, but, even the climate Leviathan stuff, I, I, I don't think people are going to to like what they get, and it's going to be used to justify the rule of the people who are currently in power. I think that's absolutely true. Well, we need pick your favorite climate Mao, climate Castro, climate Lenin. Uh, my comrades and I often talk about climate Castro, where you re reference methodological nationalism. Well, what was what was Cuban socialism's orientation to the national struggle? It understood that it lived or died on international solidarity. And so sometimes there were mistakes, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Congo, but also sometimes there were profound victories, uh, uh, the intervention in Angola and the eventual defeat of South African apartheid, the support for Nicaragua, the support for Venezuela, that there are lessons of internationalism that can be brought to bear. In contrast to my uh, colleagues, uh, the geographers Wainwright and Mann, who wrote Climate Leviathan, who, frankly, I just dismiss climate Mao in a very, very, which doesn't even really relate to what Mao is doing, um, and just dismiss it. If there is a history from which to draw, it is precisely the linking the internationalist solidarity uh, 
of these national liberation projects like the Soviet and Chinese revolutions to provide a counterweight to American imperialism. And yeah. they paid the price for it. Yeah, I mean, well, that, that it brings up the elephant in the room, which, you know, when we talk about the great tragedies of socialist history, I'm like, the Sino-Soviet split is probably the biggest one. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, China integrating with the West for its developmental needs becomes the only way after that point. And right. also the Soviet Union has no one to work with that, that's of significant size. Um, and I mean, it, it it definitely stalled things out in, in, in Cuba. And uh, I, I am one of these these people and I know I, I've been told that I'm soft on Stalinist for this, uh, whatever. Um, uh, the fact that I call him Stalinist usually indicates that I'm not, but, uh, but the, that I, that I think the Cuban revolution is like all of the actually existing socialist revolutions, the Cuban one's the easiest one to support because it's, you know, like, because it was internationally oriented because it's not ethnically, there's not like an ethnic homogen uh, homogeneity emerged out of it because it, it's not to say the Cuban revolution wasn't bloody. It was, but, and it's not to say there wasn't mistakes like how, like what you're talking, uh, Ethiopia. Also, Cuba took a long time to figure out how to handle the age crisis, but so did everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there were mistakes, and I don't want to downplay that. Some of them, some of them are really quite bad, but I, I think that is like the primary model. Like it, to look at us, like you want to look at a successful socialist state that ends up that that doesn't do a whole lot of atrocity mongering or anything like that. You look at Cuba. But like, the Soviets, the Soviets were not atrocity mongering either. I mean, there's, I, I'm not sure what inst we can we can dig into it. But Cuban Cuba is only there because of the Soviet Union. Absolutely, no. Um, I, I, I'm a I'm a defensist. I, I tend to, uh, I tend to push back on people who don't want to deal with like the Yuzhov China and stuff like that. Uh, people don't want to deal with the purges and some of the mess around prep uh, preparing for um, the wars because I think that's the context of a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but I am not one of these people who like, then go, who goes like, Oh, because of that. And because of the, the excesses of, of the 1930s that we should just throw the Soviet union into the dustbin of history. I think that's ridiculous. And, um, I do think it was an overly military militarized society and that limited it in ways that became a huge problem by the 1980s. But I don't think like that didn't happen because of, of just bad faith. It, it happened because they were boxed in and it, it happened because the German revolution failed and it happened because the, the social Democrats increasingly moved right, as opposed to like trying to make some concessions to the Bolsheviks and, and healing that rift, which was never healed, et cetera. I mean, those are, you know, those are all things that are, that are super important. Um, I mean, and, the whole point of Stalinism properly conceived. So in, in, in that period, let's say until his death, um, the whole point of Stalinism in the thirties was to avoid counter-revolution and build a state an economy, a military and a food system that would not crack under the hammer blows of German invasion. And so that doesn't mean everything is excused, but it means that was its strategic world historical priority to which everything else was sacrificed. And in the West, you know, leftist intellectuals love the oppressed as long as they don't win and as long as they don't build a, a state and a military that can, uh, can, uh, that can sustain defense against fascist invasion or imperialist invasion. And so I think a lot of this, not in your case, but in a lot of a lot of people's minds, this issue is entirely omitted that you build a food system with 150,000 uh, collective farms. So the food system won't crack. Whereas if you have four and a half million peasant households, it's a completely different matter. You build an industry that won't crack, a state and an army that won't break, all of which happened, as we know, in 1916 and 1917 under a far weaker military intervention. People can't, I, I think this point can't be emphasized enough uh, for those who don't know the history that the German invasion in June, 1941 was the greatest military operation in human history yep. before or since. 
Yeah, I mean, and also like the, the Russian casualties in that were something like 120 percent. I mean, it's 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 absurd what they paid for that. Um, I think. I think one of the things that we have to do as far as like when we confront, I mean, this is way beyond the scope of eco-socialism in some degrees, but when we confront, uh, say, the USSR in the 1930s, um, I can't justify the Yushov China. I can't, but I can put the context of what happened beyond just Stalin bad. And right. that's something we, we have to do because yes, some of it is about personalities. Some of it is about uh, concessions. And I do think like an attempt to totally redeem Stalin is probably misguided too. Agreed. But um, I could definitely think that, but the, the context in which that happens, one of the things that I, you know, I pointed out, yeah, the purges are not like the, the purges taking so many people out. That's not just like Stalin's machinations to kill all of his former comrades. That's also like social forces being unleashed during this period of also rapid as, of industrialization where there's pent up violence and, and a need to both, develop and control a nomenclatura and and ethnic tensions or whatever that just spill out yeah like and uh yes a, a social you know a socialist transition has to handle that but um you know my sort of like dire you know you know marxist prediction of history is i kind of think that it was somewhat inevitable once the german revolution failed and then and uh the social Democrats and the Bolsheviks basically refuse to cooperate ever. <laughs> like, like it, it's it, to me that uh, when people, you know, cause I, I tend to be one of these people, even though I'm, I'm not an anti Trotskyist, but I don't want to come off of that either. But I tend to be when people think, Oh, if Trotsky had run the Soviet union, it wouldn't have been that way. I'm like, I don't His know. program man. was the same fucking program. Right. I mean, actually like, he would have accelerated some things that That's were right. you talk about like the deaths of, of, of agricultural collectivization. Well, the Bakarin period uh, was, was nicer about that than Trotsky would have been explicitly like, Oh yeah. Um, so t I, I've always just found that to be kind of a cope. Um, and and also to misunderstand the nature of like these social forces uh and so and similarly with like when we talk about mao i always point out that like like there yes there are ma there there are massive deaths in, in in the transition um particularly in the great leap forward however uh, uh greatly overstated as well by the, yeah. the demographers who studied that originally oh yeah well um how, however, I just want to be like, it, 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 the, the, uh, the average life increase went up during the Great Leap Forward. Like, yeah. life expectancy went up by like 10 years during the Great Leap Forward. So, while it was bad, it was actually still an improvement to the prior conditions. Look, I think, I think this speaks to the point of a lot of what we've been going over that as socialists, we need to draw a sober balance sheet, mm -hmm. not an ideologically charged one. And yes, there's no escape from ideology and all this, but we need to draw sober balance sheets uh, and to draw lessons, negative and positive, from the experiences of state socialism. That's going to be fundamental as we try to move forward in envisioning a socialist strategy. The other part uh, is that I think most of the eco-left has frankly no sense and no real interest in dealing with the excruciating ethical, political, moral choices around violence and policy that will be, everyone will be called socialist, capitalist, fascist, whatever. Everybody will call, be called to make in the era of the climate crisis. And there is an almost an inability or right now let's call it an unwillingness because I think the ability is there to deal with these excruciatingly painful, difficult situations in which, as you said earlier, 
there are bad situations in which we have to make choices and they may not be equally bad, but they will be differentially bad. And we need to be able to make the best choice for moving forward to then get to a good situation from a very bad one. Yeah, I think um, I was reminded of a quote where where Marx talks about uh, we don't lie to the population. We tell them there'll be 50, there'll be at least 50 years of civil wars and whatever to the transition. And I and there was a move away from that, even in the second international to being honest about what that meant. I mean, you know, when Ingalls talked about the parliamentary road to socialism, he also like admit, like admitted like you're going to be in a you're going to be. Even if you win, you're going to be in a defensive civil war almost immediately. Um, when it comes to these things now, I think there's two things. One is we've lived through a period in the imperial core, asterisk, of seeming peace where like most of the violence is hidden from us. Um, and since most of us don't serve in the military or whatnot, uh, we have not been exposed to it. Um it was eye-opening for me to travel the world during the during like the Syria, uh, the Syrian civil war, et cetera, and during the cartel wars in Latin America, to really see the cost of that. Which I, you know, I, I am one of these people who think that that like even stuff like the cartel wars are totally tied into U.S. imperialism and state capitulation to to uh, local state capitulation to said imperialism, um, uh, which is not to excuse like the lump and bourgeoisie or whatever either. I mean, they're real, but uh, it, it is to put it in, in some kind of global context. There's a reason why, for example, when you talk about like uh, cartel war violence, uh, the, the uh, so far from God, so close to the United States thing comes into, yeah, to, yeah. to, to huge prominence. <laughs> Uh, so uh, there, there is, there is definitely that. And I think we have to like, you know, I am one of those people who thinks that socialism ultimately will be stateless, but I'm also one of these people who totally admits that like, you can't get there without, without states right now. You have to deal with the special forces, the death squads, the Phoenix assassination programs, the drones, the bombers, the napalm, the, the chemical biological warfare, there has to be a sober assessment of the history of, of how movements have dealt with those uh, threats. Yeah, absolutely. And in the scale and technological capacity of those threats r- right now, we're at a scale that that's almost impossible to to deal with, which makes a lot of socialists refusing to deal with stuff like the military uh, or what, you know, uh, at all, um, you know, kind of irresponsible and to put yep. it nicely um and I, I think we have to be yeah you have to be absolutely honest about that and i i do think your, your call for a sober balance sheet is important i i think we have to the last thing we have to deal with is deal with the legacy of profound anti-communism um and and in doing that what I don't think we do is just invert it. I don't think you can just like, oh, well, everything said by anti-communist is lies because it isn't all. Right. But we do have to be honest about it. Um, and when we're talking about, I don't know, the survival of humanity, for example, which I'm not sure. Like, I am actually not sure we're actually at that kind of existential crisis. But I think we are at a potential for like. Well, in terms of nuclear war, we are. Yes, that's true, actually, yeah. Uh, and, and with the climate crisis, I think we are, we could be in for it, for the developing world to have a massive population hit. Um, I think we've already seen that with the way Pakistan has been handled, for example. Right. Um, and, you know, I don't want that blood on my hands. I just want to put that, I want to say that pretty pretty clearly, that, 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 a socialism that doesn't deal with internationalism, even in the eco- even in ecological development, right now, is effectively a socialism that is turning it, it's turning its head to uh, hands full, you know, being totally awash with blood. Right. And 
Um, I don't think it has to be that way. And I, I think we, uh, yeah, I, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be hard though to break people out of that for a little while. And I'm, that's my immediate worry that like to tie it back to something we were talking about earlier, I think in the immediate term, it looks like anti-imperialism may be in right wing guys. And I don't think that's great. Like, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not one of these people who thinks like right wing anti-imperialism is really even truly anti-imperial. Like the Monroe doctrine is still an imperial doctrine, but, uh, it is something that that seems to speak to um, the reality of the return to multipolarity or whatever that agreed. That it, yeah, liberals have known about for twenty years. I mean, Fried Zakaria was talking about that shit in two thousand and six, but um, has been totally ignored. You know. Anyway, um, final points. <laughs> well, I think. I think I would return to my observation about the long history of climate crises and class society, including in the history of capitalism, that moments of dramatically unfavorable climate change are also moments of real political possibility. And this was true for the 17th century climate crisis, which was a moment of profound social revolt. This was the era of the Fronde in France, of the English Civil War, Cromwell cuts the head off the King of England and finds himself faced with a communist army of levelers and diggers outside of London. And similarly, the age of Maltus was the age of revolution of the Haitian and French revolutions, the Irish revolt, a class revolt in the English countryside around the price of food and the rapacity of enclosures. So there is a longer history of unfavorable climate that is yes, indeed, on the one hand, in, a, in an immediate and day-to-day -day sense, a moment of hardship for the vast majority. On the other hand, it tends to unravel the underlying conditions for ruling class power. That can't be forgotten. In fact, in the 20th century, the best parallel um, is the history of great world wars, which tended to unravel the history, uh, the, the power of the great regimes, as we've been talking about with the Soviet Union, China, we can think of many other places around the world and the great uh, frenzy of, uh, of decolonization after World War II. Uh, we want to keep in mind that these dynamics of destabilization are not to be feared. We must assess them. We must not be, as you say, sort of Pollyannish about them. Uh, we don't need, the, the antidote to climate doom isn't a kind of Panglossian approach. It is, again, to return to the real sober drawing of balance sheets so that we can discern, as Lenin would remind us, the weak links in the imperialist chains of power. And I think on that basis, we can actually be hopeful that we can resist the climate emergency rhetoric and try to pierce the veil of the dominant cosmology of man against nature, society and nature, and the ways that people talk about those, those are cages for our imagination. And the real dialectical and, and emancipatory and revolutionary possibilities were signaled, I've been saying lately and writing about this at some length, were signaled by Marx, who begins his critique of idealism with the critique of abstract man. Everybody forgets this, but it was the critique of man in general, a point that's made in the manifesto even, and that the way to comprehend the revolutionary struggle is the dialectical unity of, well, as Marx says in Capital, of the soil and the worker. Uh, that, to quote him from the, uh, qu he, uh, quote him quoting Thomas Munzer, uh, the creatures too must go free. There is a sense that the, the liberation of the proletariat is also a liberation of life. And that that is what the proletarian standpoint, the planetary proletarian standpoint allows. I think an ecology of hope and liberation against the doomism of the ruling class, but also, unfortunately, of much of the climate left. That's a great point to end on. Thank you so much. Um, anything you'd like to plug? It's always feel weird as a communist party. Uh, well, for those who are curious about any of this, you can go to my website, 
It's jasonwmore.com and uh, it's all there. So uh, I encourage you to go check it all out and verify, test, uh, challenge, uh, all in the interest of a comradely reimagination of our crisis and the possibilities moving forward. Uh, yep. All right. Thank you so much.